Holy City Center Radio, this is episode 256, and I am your host, Christian Sanger. Today is Friday, May 24th, 2024. It's Friday in the Holy City. If you are looking for plans, the old or should I say the original events calendar is back up and running. Go to holycitycenter.com slash calendar. You can find out what's going on in town this weekend and beyond. Still have plenty of work and things to add to it, but it's it, it's far enough along that I was okay, uh, you know, officially launching it and getting rid of the, uh, what was at the time, the newer events page. Um, this and already the feedback's been great a lot of people happy to have the uh, original calendar back so if you need plans go check it out uh, but just know that yeah i'll be constantly updating it as i always have but uh there's plenty that uh you know of events that have been announced previously that i just haven't gotten on there yet uh but you know there's a good chunk of things on there so you should be able to find something to do and since we had a little break there we you know as i've been pretty busy and missed a few episodes that you know we normally would have scheduled there's a lot of news to get into so much news that i and probably no not probably i'm not going to be able to get to everything i want to in this episode uh, but i'm going to try to get through as much as i can uh, while still keeping the episode around the normal runtime um, as to not overload, uh, number one, my producer, uh, Lindsay Marie Collins with LMC Sound System, and, and you all as well, because I know you don't want to hear me rambling. You don't want a super long episode. You, it's Friday. You want to get out there and have fun. So no further delays from me. Let's get into the news. First up, Best of Charleston 2024 officially in the books now that the charleston city paper uh, a week ago today released the issue and announced all the award winners they held a party a few days before that um but yes uh the latest issue uh the latest awards issue i should say is out and i'm happy and honored to say for the 11th consecutive year Holy City Center was lucky enough to win at least one award. Uh, this is the first time, believe it or not, for 10 straight years, uh, Holy City Center won at least two awards, uh, which has been an incredible run for me. And I'm, I'm so honored and um, you know proud of th that accomplishment, uh, but still very much happy to even win just one award. Uh, so although wasn't able to pull off at least two for 11 straight years, uh, we did get at least one. Uh, so this year, Holy City Center won Best Local Twitter slash X account. Uh, it's the 10th overall time that Holy City Center has won that award. Uh, another mark I'm um, proud of. Uh, and then in addition, it's a nice little consolation prize. Uh, Holy City Center was a runner-up in two categories this year, Best Local Website and Best Local Social Media Influencer, uh, both of which uh, Holy City Center has won, I think, once each in the past. Um, but regardless, being a, a runner up in two categories and then winning one is still really awesome. And, uh, you know, I don't take a lot of time and step back and appreciate these things. So I'm trying to do better about that. Uh, but the, the truth is I wouldn't win these things without your votes. And, uh, just because I win them doesn't necessarily mean that it's true. Uh, I certainly over the years, there's been times I've won certain things. I'm like, oh, I'm really not the best ex, well, you know, whatever. Um, uh, you know, I feel like so-and-so was, and, you know, I know how these things go. It just depends on who can get people to vote for them. It doesn't necessarily mean that they're the actual best of whatever category they win. So truly, I really, really appreciate anyone who takes the time to nominate, vote, um, or, or does things throughout the year that even if you forgot to vote, if you're sharing Holy City Center articles, retweeting, whatever, Getting the name out there certainly uh, leads to the possibility that you'll get more votes for, say, an entity whose name just hasn't, uh, you know, been around that long. Uh, you know, sometimes with these awards, I think people just say, oh, I recognize that name. And even though I don't really pay attention, I'm sure they deserve to win or whatever. So um, it's just one of those things where sometimes businesses that have been around for a while, just kind of automatically uh, get voted for because people recognize the name. I mean, I've been guilty of that when I voted for certain categories. I'm like, I've never heard of this one and this one. So the two I heard of must be the best. And so that is all to say, I really appreciate uh, anyone who voted. And it means a lot to me, um, you know, regardless of, 
you know, my personal thoughts like, well, I do appreciate winning such and such or being a runner up. I really shouldn't have been in this. Uh, I just appreciate people, uh, you know, taking the time um, to do that, even even if I don't necessarily deserve some of those things. So thank you all so, so much. I really appreciate it. Some sad news, uh, a place that was, uh, you know, basically a second home to me or maybe like a third home, you know, between work, uh, you know, being at uh, certain jobs uh, for long hours in the past and my actual home wherever I'm living at the time. But uh, a place that really was kind of like my third home, the alley in downtown Charleston, one that I've always uh, praised pretty much since they opened for being such a unique venue. Um, I'm sad to say, and I'm sure many of you've heard this by now, that they will be closing on June 1st. That'll be their last day of business. It's a Saturday. Uh, so anytime between now and then, you can go visit uh, the venue and you know whatever your favorite thing to do there was, or if you never got there, go check it out. Um, the reason I loved it so much, uh, besides the fact that uh, it's just a really cool venue with nothing like it downtown, especially when it opened over a decade ago, there are some bowling alley or uh, some bowling lanes in the back, hence the name the alley. Uh, so there's people who went there all the time to bowl. There's bowling leagues, uh, birthday parties. You know, kids could be there. I think kids were allowed to be in the venue up until like 8 p.m. and then it was like you had to be 21 plus to be there. Uh, so, you know, they had all those events going on. They also have like arcade games and they would for I think for most of their time there had free video game nights uh, where you could go in just about any of those video games, arcade games you could play without having to put in a quarter or two or whatever it is. Um, and they also had a bar. Restaurant event space that was kind of like uh, upstairs in one section. Number one, it's just a very big vet venue for downtown. There's not a lot that are that big because we all know how downtown is. Some buildings are designed kind of weird. And, um, you know, there's, through the years, there'll be businesses sharing what was possibly previously just for one business, but they've like sectioned it off. And so that was, you know, there was a space there. But as you just heard me say, there was always so much different things that you could do there. And seeing the outpouring of support, I haven't seen a lot of that. When businesses close, you know, people will sometimes say, oh, that's a bummer. I really like that place. You know, you see that all the time, especially businesses that have been open for several years. But it's rare that a business gets, you know, these pieces, people are writing, you know, whether it's uh, bloggers or, um, you know, someone who has their own little uh, website or, you know, a social media influencer or whatever. It's rare that you're getting these kinds of things written about them and, and people making a big deal out of it, unless you're one of these more iconic places, like when Martha Lou's closed, for instance, there was a ton of people writing about it, not just locally, but nationally, if I remember correctly. And this big kind of outpouring of, you know, just memories and, you know, uh, reminiscing and thank yous and, and all that kind of stuff. Uh, it doesn't happen often, but I've seen lots of those for the alley, people who have moved away, people who are still here. And, and each person seemed to have a different thing to say. You know, some are talking about how much they're going to miss the, their bowling league that they had. Others are just talking about how much they're going to miss having a hangout. Some were just like, oh, we always went there for a corp or, you know, my businesses, um, annual Christmas party or whatever. And I'm going to miss having that as our spot every year. And so it's just been nice to see that, but a, a bummer for sure. Um, and like I said, especially when I lived downtown, I was there constantly. Uh, and the other reason that I loved it so much was the staff. Number one owner, David Crawley has become a friend of mine. And uh, he was always super nice to me when I would periodically host uh, Holy City Center like anniversary parties where I would, you know, do like a raffle for charity and um, would you know just invite anybody who wanted to come to show up. And if you wanted to participate, you could. If not, just hang out and meet other people. Uh, back when Twitter wasn't a toxic cesspool uh, and there was like a kind of small Charleston community on there, we used to hold. I, I say we, but I didn't actually plan any of them. Uh, someone would plan what's called a tweet up where we used to just go. Uh, to a venue and it was always the alley and you know, you'd meet people like, Oh, you're at so-and-so on Twitter. Oh, it's so nice to finally meet you. I love your account for this reason. You know, it's just, they had these studio 300 parties, which were their anniversary slash Halloween parties. They've hosted, uh, you know, world cup events where this place was packed out. 
Uh, just I have so many great memories there. Uh, plenty of, I'm sure, great nights that I have forgotten chunks of um, back in my heyday of living downtown and uh, doing my share of drinking. Uh, but uh, just as I've gone through different stages of my life here in Charleston over the last decade, it's been a place where whether I was going there multiple times a night or maybe, you know, once every couple months, it, it's always been somewhere that I felt comfortable and enjoyed. And, and outside of the owner, um, who's again, just been so great. Anytime I've wanted to do something at the venue, the staff has always been great. A lot of them are there for years and years. There's a few that are still there from when they first open. They've always been nice and kind. Some have become friends of mine. Um, just because they cared and asked you questions, you know, if you were sitting at the bar or whatever, and they take part in the conversation with you. Now, don't get me wrong. If they got a vibe that like, oh, no, this person wants to be left alone, they certainly would leave you alone. But if you were like, yeah, yeah, I'll tell you about whatever, you know, they just it, it was the best. They were the best uh, and they are the best. And it was just a great place. So it's just sad to see that, that place close and making it even sadder is that it was kind of out of their hands and not because they were doing poorly. Uh, whoever owns the building, unfortunately, is, is not someone who's associated with the alley outside of the fact that they were you know, leasing the space to them. They sold it. And the group that they sold it to wants to build a hotel there. And although we've known this was going to happen at some point, it finally was fully approved by the city. And the announcement came down. And then the owners had to the owner had to decide what to do. And based on the timeline and, and some information he got from the you know the folks behind this new hotel, he ultimately had to decide that June first was going to be the last day of business. Uh, it was announced you know maybe three weeks before that date. Uh, so obviously you know in talking to some folks, not just people, customers, but employees, former employees, it's it's a, they're very sad and it's uh, you know kind of came up a little quicker than they were thinking. Uh, but to be clear, the owners of the alley had nothing to do with the closure, nothing to do with this hotel. They didn't own the property. It was completely out of their hands. And I know uh, the owner is struggling. Uh, this is it's you know, it's tough to see your business, especially when your business is forced to close for something like that versus like, hey, you know what? It just didn't work out. We didn't have the business. When you're doing well and you have created this thing and the staff and yeah, it's uh, it's it's tough on him and and tough on a lot of people, and and I'm I'm sorry to see you know them going through that, you know, because as tough as it is on customers, obviously it, it it's probably more tough on the people who work there, losing a job, uh, and then having it taken away from you in that manner. Uh, I'm sure they're all going to land on their feet and be okay. You know, they're uh, they were valuable there and great employees there. They'll be the same in another place uh, and should get hired pretty quickly based on reputation, but a, a bummer for sure. And uh, I didn't plan to talk about it that much, but it's in my, been on my mind for a while and you know, just how important that place was to me and how much I enjoyed going there. Um, so whether you've been there before or not, go check them out. You have until June 1st. Uh, if you, enjoy the place let the people know that you know, it helps i'm sure he them hearing like how important the place was to you or how much you enjoyed something or whatever how their food is really good and that's a surprise at a lot of bars when you're like oh their food's actually really good here um so get there give them a last hurrah over these last you know couple of weeks so they can go out in style but the alley you will be greatly missed <laughs> All right, going to go over to politics real quick. As expected, Governor Henry McMaster on Tuesday signed into law a ban on gender-affirming care for transgender minors. Uh, that makes South Carolina the 25th state to restrict or ban such care for minors. Uh, we knew this was coming. I, I was surprised he didn't like sign it immediately uh, when it was originally passed, uh, both uh, the House and Senate, uh, of um, the state House and Senate, that is, of course, a couple weeks ago. Um, but he you know, ended up doing it eventually. But the law bars health professionals from performing gender transition surgeries, prescribing puberty blockers, and overseeing hormone treatments for patients under 18. In addition to that, school principals or vice principals would have to notify parents or guardians if their child wanted to use a name other than their legal one 
or you know some sort of nickname or pronouns that do not match their sex assigned at birth essentially uh forcibly outing these students to their parents regardless if the students want to be or not so they either are going to be forced outed to their parents or they're just not going to tell anyone at school what they want their name to be or what their pronouns are uh and they'll just re- be, remain you know having to act as someone they are not the cruelty is often the point with a lot of these pieces of legislation and this is putting kids in danger for multiple reasons we've talked about it before these types of uh, transitions uh when done appropriately as you know if they're seeing a doctor uh it is in all likelihood being done appropriately as they are the ones who have studied this. Uh, they, they are not just willy nilly doing things uh, without a long process and making sure it's the right decision, but forcing kids to not be themselves, to be afraid of coming out. It leads to higher rates of mental health issues, suicide, uh, forced outings can lead to parents disowning kids, kicking them out all sorts of problems, but didn't matter to our governor or a certain faction of our state legislature. Now, uh, one thing that was changed, the bill uh, did have a change in the Senate that will allow mental health counselors to talk about banned treatments and even suggest a place where they are legal. Uh, Doctors can also prescribe puberty blockers for some conditions for which they are prescribed, such as when a child begins what is called Uh, precocious period puberty which you know can happen to someone as young as the age of four so there's still some exceptions but anything related to gender affirming care um, is not going to be allowed Uh, at least doctors can talk about what treatments are available in other states Um, you know it it even suggests places to go uh, which we've seen sometimes would say like abortion laws in certain states that that like can't even be discussed or uh, you know they can't be guided to where to go for some of those treatments so that was one change that we did see uh, from the past bills but the the rest of it uh, pretty much stayed as is I'm sure we will see fallout from this before much too long National Nancy back in the news. No surprise there. Uh, You may remember three months ago, Representative Nancy Mace uh, had a string of problems with her staff. Um, Just three months ago, the Republican Congresswoman fired or lost nine staffers from her Washington, D.C. office, uh, and many of them trashed her to the media on their way out. We've talked about that before in previous episodes. Well, um, she decided to hit back in an interview with the Daily Mail, or well, DailyMail.com, excuse me, where she said some of her uh, departed staffers mismanaged $1 million. She claims they hacked her phone, spied on her medical records, and even submerged electronic devices in water, deleted files, uh, all these uh, uh, just wild accusations from someone who sounds not paranoid at all. Um, she even claimed that Some of her former staffers went as far as snooping on her children's calendars and would monitor doctor's appointments. She also said they signed uh, her name on documents that they didn't have permission to do. Um, So those are Representative Mace's accusations about these former staffers. They've had different things to say. Uh, Some of those staffers responded to this article saying that it's ridiculous. Uh, Some of these accusations are just completely ridiculous. Uh, you know, claiming things like this whole submerged electronic device thing was actually someone accidentally spilled some water on like their laptop or something. Uh, so it wasn't even like they threw their phone in like a glass of water to make sure no one could get the data off of it. So they they said that wasn't accurate. They said no one was spying on medical records or her children's calendars. Rather, Representative Mace gave them access to a shared calendar. And, you know, that was supposed to be they would know where she was if if they need to get a hold of her um, or uh, be able to plan out her schedule, you know, for TV appearances, say, like, oh, you can do this day and this day because you don't have anything on your calendar or at this time, I should say. I'm sure she's got plenty on her calendar. But uh, if so, if she added something in there like doctor's appointment, obviously her staffers are going to see it. 
Uh, so that that's what they were saying. Uh, they also push back on all the other claims that I mentioned. Visit the link in the show notes if you want to read all the drama. Um, you know, and, and as usual, there's three sides to every story. So we've got the former staffers, we've got Representative Mace, and of course, the truth is probably somewhere in the middle. So no one's really looking good in this scenario, which still goes back to the leader in this scenario, Representative Mace. There's going to be some fault on her side. It's going to be some fault on the staffer side. But to have this much drama and these kind of accusations also speaks to who are you hiring? Why are you so bad at hiring staffers if this is what they're doing to you? Uh, Which, again, doesn't reflect well on her. So either she's making this up or exaggerating it. Or if it's all true, she has had the worst staffers in the history of Congress, uh, which is like, how did you miss all this? So... Uh, Just, again, all sorts of drama there. In addition to that, um, she was recently criticized uh, by one of her Republican primary opponents, uh, Catherine Templeton, who said that Mace had declined uh, taking part in a televised Republican primary debate. Um, Now, Mace's campaign apparently pushed back on this, but it turned out the reason they were pushing back is because Templeton's campaign had accidentally put like the wrong TV stations in the like press release or wherever they posted this originally. And they corrected that. And since they corrected that Mace's campaign hasn't said anything, it was something like, Oh, these made up debates. We've never even heard of this, but it was the technicality that there was just a mistake in the TV stations. And that's, where it stands right now i haven't seen anything to the contrary now that templeton's campaign corrected it said i'm sorry we said this tv station and this tv station but it's actually these two instead (laughs) it's like a whole semantics thing so anyway national nancy always something with her Somerville Town Council has approved uh, a hate intimidation ordinance. This happened uh, on Thursday night's meeting. Uh, the law passed four to three in its second and final reading. And of course, this is to, you know, the, the aim here is to protect students who feel, or students, I'm sorry, citizens who feel unsafe because of factors such as skin color, religious beliefs, gender identity, or sexual orientation. Uh, Somerville's proposal will include penalties of up to a $500 fine and 30 days in jail for crimes committed in discriminatory and hateful manner. Uh, this is one. This is the latest town who has passed something like this. Uh, you may remember Mount Pleasant has passed something similar. And you may be asking, why are cities doing this and not the state? Well, the state has refused to bring up any hate crime ordinance whatsoever. And when I say the state, I obviously mean one party, and it's spe- specifically uh, that party's leader, um, just refusing to bring this up, making South Carolina one of only two states, Wyoming being the other, without any hate crime ordinance on the books whatsoever. So great that Somerville has decided to move forward with this because when the state is failing in its duties, the city sometimes have to step in and try to protect its citizens if the state state is not going to. And lastly, an update on the UFO Welcome Center in Bowman. You may remember that the unique structure caught fire back on May 9th and was completely destroyed. A lot of people have wondered what the status is there as far as is it going to come back? Well, Jody Penn Darvis, who is the person who built that UFO Welcome Center in Bowman back in the 90s, uh, is unsure if he will attempt to make another such spaceship. We're using the term spaceship loosely here. This thing didn't wasn't able to move it was just a structure uh but he basically said it's still up in the air um you know everything basically was destroyed only a few things survived in in addition to losing that 16 foot tall structure uh that he spent 25 years building and upkeeping he also lost his trailer home that sat behind it now the good news is he does have another trailer um you know, just about a mile down the road from where the uh, UFO Welcome Center was, and he's currently staying there. So he has a roof over his head, but the problem for this gentleman is that that trailer doesn't have electricity or water. So obviously that's another concern, a a more primary concern, uh, than if he's going to rebuild the UFO Welcome Center, um, you know, is that this poor gentleman also lost a home and is now somewhere where he doesn't have electricity or water. Uh, And he's at 73 years old, he's thinking he may have to you know, go back to work. He had been uh, laid off in 2023 and told the Post and Courier that her savings uh, are dwindling. And, and like I said, he may have to go back to work at the age of 73. And he's worried 
uh, that no one's going to want to hire him because of that age. Although we all know, you know, you're not supposed to have any age discrimination, but you know how that goes. You can't prove in most cases that someone wasn't hired because of their age. So uh, an understandable concern of his. Now, as far as what caused the fire, there's been no official um, explanation yet. Pendarvis suspects that a power line that was running near the structure um, that he had noticed actually was getting lower and lower uh, may have been the source of the fire. But again, no official report has been filed. Uh, A Post and Courier found out that Pendarvis said roughly $35,000 is what he spent over the years to construct the UFO Welcome Center, which was built from plywood and some other materials. Uh, But he imagined he would need about $100,000 to rebuild it and, of course, uh, a trailer on the property as well. So we'll see what happens um, if there's any kind of, like I've told you in the past, if I see any GoFundMe that comes up or if he decides that he wants some help, uh, we'll certainly update you on that. And I know I said lastly, but I've got a couple more minutes. I'm just going to squeeze this story in because it's an important one. Uh, A Berkeley County grand jury uh, this week indicted a former Somerville police officer by the name of Anthony DeLustro uh, for attempted kidnapping and murder charges related to that shooting that happened outside of a Somerville Chick-fil-A. You may remember me talking about this previously. It happened back on March 20th. DeLustro, who is 64 years old, uh, was uh, and at the time was off duty. Uh, with the Somerville Police Department after this incident, they let him go. Um, And he allegedly attempted to kidnap Michael O'Neill, who was 39 years old and was visiting from North Carolina. They got into some kind of argument uh, in that Chick-fil-A in Somerville on that main street. Um, In that process, uh, O'Neill was shot and killed by DeLustro. Um, Somerville Police Chief Doug Wright requested that the case be independently investigated by SLED, who ultimately arrested and charged Delustro back on April 10th. Now, he was only charged with murder at that time, but after a grand jury uh, looked at some of the evidence from SLED and, and uh, working with Solicitor Scarlett Wilson's office, they ended up adding that attempted kidnapping charge, which relates to Delustro trying to uh, detain uh, O'Neill at the scene. Um, so we still have the court case to go innocent until proven guilty and all of that, of course. Um, but it will certainly be a high profile case in this area. Um, in South Carolina, if you're wondering, murder carries a minimum penalty of 30 years in prison. The maximum is life in prison. Um, as far as attempted kidnapping, that carries a penalty of up to 30 years in prison. So if he is found guilty of one or both of these, he's obviously looking at significant jail time. But a very big development this week. Wanted to make sure I updated you all on that in case you missed the news. Because uh, in some ways it felt like that kind of flew under the radar um, for whatever reason. Um, whereas when the incident actually happened, it made a huge news. So uh, that is the latest on that. And that'll do it for this Friday edition of Holy City Center Radio. I hope you enjoyed it. Get out there. and Just have so much fun this weekend. Um, if you need any assistance finding plans, holycitycenter.com slash calendar. If you have a chance, please rate and review this episode. Subscribe if you haven't already. Share it with someone who may be interested. Um, I really appreciate that. I also appreciate Lindsay Marie Collins with LMC Sound System for producing this in every episode of Holy City Center Radio and Tyler Boone, whose music you hear in each and every show. I'll be back on Monday. I believe I will have an interview for you on Monday, so you have that to look forward to. And then, of course, at some point, try to get you caught up on all the other news I wasn't able to get to today. Always a lot to talk about, and I look forward to being back with you again on Monday. But until then, good night and good luck.